Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and welcome to Custody Matters Live. We have a special guest that's Dr. Sally Brisbane Stone. She is a longtime educator and administrator all the way from the elementary grades to the collegiate level. And she just happens to be also one of our guest speakers in next month's conference, the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference. Welcome, Dr. Sally. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here, Danica, and I'm excited about the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference coming up it is just a lot of excitement about around the topic and, and what I know is going to be an amazing conference so thank you thank you for allowing me to be on the show with you tonight today and I'm looking forward to to a robust conversation yes you know one of the things that I thought was important because a lot of the other conferences that I've been to and been part of helping to create we've um, addressed mental health issues, we've addressed the legal ends and, uh, and all that. This conference, we're bringing in all different kinds of asset, uh, aspects of um, around um, custody situations. And uh, one of them we had Dr. or we have Mark Ludwig and he brought in the legislative end of it, which was great because uh, it's something that a lot of people don't really understand how it is um, politically how we can make change. So the other one that I thought was super important is to have you come on as an administrator's perspective because parents, uh, all the, the schools, they're the ones that actually get boots on the ground, have to deal with these parents who are in conflict. Um, and that's something that you're going to be talking about at the conference. Is that right? It is absolutely something that is so pertinent to the conversation. And I just would like to take a step back and say how awesome it is that you have taken the steps to thoroughly consider all the pieces that are uh, an important part of what needs to take place to ensure that young people or students or just schools overall have a safe and nurturing environments for students to learn. And so when I think about the perspective of an administrator or uh, teachers in the classroom, in fact, let me just think about it from the perspective of a community as a whole. And that community may, is made up of all those different parts and pieces from the crossing guard to the cafeteria server. All of those individuals fall under the auspices of the principal who is obviously the leader of the school. But if you think about the touch impact that every one of those entities has with the student that say, for example, is in conflict and that student gets up and they come to school and they pass the crossing guard and then they come on campus and they may pass a custodian or they may go to the cafeteria and they see a service worker. All of that before they get to the classroom and have an opportunity to deal or be impacted by the, the teacher or the administrator. So I wanted to kind of paint the picture of the community from the perspective of when that student is involved in a contentious or when the family is a, a dysfunctional situation, it has so many different layers that are important to understand. And so from my lens or through my lens as a building principal, having had experience as you, as, as you point out from elementary school all the way up to the collegiate level, one thing that is consistent is the family structure and the dynamics of the relationships as it pertains to how students in conflict are handled and dealt with. I would say that as an administrator, as a building principal, one of the things that is very much pushed and promoted from our perspective is our role in the family dynamic. The school is a family, obviously, the family in and of itself. If you think about the term in loco parentis, which is a part of what is taught in ed leadership, it means that I am the local parent for that child. And loco parentis means that whatever is happening with that child on that campus, um, pardon background noise, uh, whatever's happening with that child on that campus is the responsibility of the uh, principal. And so it's an, an important to know that it's, my role is not simply to just know and understand the child, but all the pieces that interact. 
And so I want to look at that through that lens because oftentimes everyone kind of takes their own space in the overall uh, uh, dynamics of what's happening with this child. So if I am the, the, the clinic aid, then all I'm concerned about is the health and well health of that child that day. If they have a cold, if they have a fever or whatever's going on with them. The classroom teacher is responsible for the classroom. The cafeteria worker makes sure that the food is. So I think that by bringing all the entities to make a long story short together in this guardians and gatekeeper conference, you are looking at all those aspects. There are guardians, there are gatekeepers. The administrative team or the principal lives in both of those uh, lanes. We are guardians and we are also gatekeepers because we have to make sure the overall dynamic of the school is conducive to making sure that the, those that we are in charge of are being treated with the equity and as well as the nurturing and caring environment that is absolutely essential for a child to be safe. Yeah, you know, I think as a as an administrator, you many times you you have to be somewhat of a detective when you you oh. see the signs that a child that just there's something off about the child. They are um, they're just not thriving, or they're maybe fighting a little bit more than than um, and they they ever did, or their their grades Absolutely. actually may go down, but they all could actually go up in reaction to the, the, the stress that they're dealing with and their parents, um, you know, divorce or- Absolutely. Or and, and think about it from this. I mean, I can give so many different examples. If we were to take a student, you know, and, and we consider their current state, that the student may have been referred to, to guidance for follow-up because there are some uh, behaviors that are showing up in the classroom. And say, for example, the grades have dropped you can actually monitor and track. And when you talk about being that gatekeeper and the detective, you can go back and look at longitudinal data that says, how was this child's grades during this particular time? Let's just say this is immediately following spring break. And during spring break, the child went to the other residential away parents' home for spring break based on their custody plan. <clears throat> so when the child comes back to school after spring break, you can notice if you were to look that their grades drop every single time they came back. If you were to do a little digging, you would see that that child goes to their away parents home every single spring break because that's the way their plan is. So you can look at key indicators that like that and begin to make some very, uh, very, very good uh uh, 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 acknowledgments, for lack of a better word, for what may be going on in the home. Why is it that every time the child goes to the away parents' home for spring break, they come back and their grades drop? Is and it because they are having a difficult time or is something else the culprit? Yeah, because there's there's hidden forms of child abuse that uh, we've talked about because a lot of times um, you never know when there's when there's parental alienation going on that maybe the child that that the other parent is being sabotaged. Maybe, exactly. You know, so they may have had a wonderful time at their other parent's home during spring break, but then there's hell to pay when they went when back they get back to their home. Exactly. Back home exactly. And now they're they're miserable. They go back to school, and from the the teacher's perspective is, oh, wow, they went to spring break with their other parents' home, and now they come back in their classroom, and they're just beside themselves. So it's not necessarily the obvious the way. It, it, exactly. And, and that's what I said. It's kind of like a, uh, a, 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 an investigative scene. You know, you, you are doing the work of trying to figure out, because the stereotype would probably tell you that something negative happened at the away parents' home. But that's not always the case. Sometimes children come back and they are guilted by the home or the residential parent and then alienated even further. And they go to school and you typically look at that that is a problem with not the custodial parent. So there are so many different dynamics at play here that you have to kind of decipher and begin to peel back the onion to look at all those different aspects as it pertains to this child. 
And it takes a study. It does take everybody coming to the table and looking at this specific individualized situation for this child, especially when you're looking at parental alienation, because now both parents are involved. And I can tell you just from experience, the very first thing that's going to happen is that first, both parents are going to blame each other. So you're going to have to wade through the, the conversation of whose fault is it? Was it the away parent? Okay, because you did this, or is the home parent? No, because you did that. And then once you get through that, then they start blaming the school. And it's the teacher's fault that the child is not doing well. And then it begins to escalate, and it makes its way. Um, and, and again, I'm speaking strictly from experience, all the way up to now it's the principal's fault. And then the calls go to the school board and the, and, and the school board now is involved in a situation that, you know, if, if there was information, and this is the point that I'm making, if there was information in the schools in the form of professional development on a continuum of, of, of seminars and workshops that are specific to the signs that you look for, as you just said, or specific to what strategies can I put into place when I see certain signs of a child in distress or crisis after they have had a visit? Because or when, you, when you think about going home for the summer break, if a child begins to decline, then it makes you wonder what's happening when they leave school. I know there was a student that I had when I was at the middle school level, and it actually was a K-8 program. And this uh, third grader, um, I'll never forget him, his name was Javante. He was the head of his home, and he had a younger sister. It was his job to wash the clothes for him and his sister so that they can get to school. His parent, his mom, you know, was a single mom, did not have any involvement in taking care of the home. So not only was he in third grade, he was responsible for his sister in first grade and himself, getting breakfast for them, getting them to school, washing their clothes so that they can get to come to school uh, well kept. And I remember a conversation with this young man and I ran into him again when he was in the sixth grade and he really had simply just acclimated to the fact that he was the responsible adult. And so I say that to say many times when we're looking at all these different factors, sometimes there isn't a parent in the picture. And so the parental alienation piece can fall on a sibling because his, his, his brothers and sisters were now who he was fighting against in order to make sure he and his sister were safe. I know that sounds kind of convoluted, but there are so many different facets of dealing with this issue. It's fascinating in the sense that there's so much that we have to learn from. And that's why it's so important for a conference such as this. Absolutely. You know, I, I know that you also uh, teach uh, domestic violence education, anger management ed education, and you also work yep. with the underserved youth. Uh, that's a lot of uh, valuable wisdoms that you're going to be able to bring to the conference. And, oh, for certain. Um, you know, they, there's just, it's... Uh, difficult because I, I know that a lot of times when parents get out of relationship with each other, they um, they start throwing daggers. They start sh telling the sins of the other person that that who shared it in confidence that uh, all kinds of things, and then they use it against them. It to try is to get absolutely the amazing. It's it's absolutely you know um, it, it it is such a strong. Um, situation where you 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 think about how in the world do people wind up in this particular uh, situation and when they start throwing those daggers they are not conscious of the fact that there's a child that's in their midst and paying attention to everything that they're saying so every single dagger that gets thrown not only hits the person they're throwing it at but it hits that child and in the curriculum, which is so rich with opportunity to, to delve into those types of uh, relationships and, and, and perceptions that we, that we have, stereotypes, it becomes apparent that if there is no uh, involvement with that child in helping them to navigate through all of those different 
things that happen, how in the world are they going to be able to be a, uh, a success in the classroom? How are they going to be able to form relationships? How are they going to be able to manage even the day-to-day -day, uh, challenges that they're faced with? We're not even talking about bullying in schools or, or, or things of that nature from kindergarten all the way up to post-secondary. And some of it gets to the point where you're dealing with it at different developmental levels. So, you know, Javante was third grade, but he was actually operating like an adult that may be 18. And, and, and that's no exaggeration. So they're basically- He did the grocery shopping. He did like everything. Surviving childhood. They're surviving childhood. Um, yes. <clears throat> many times when the parents can't get along, the parents, uh, now there's, they're, they're planting seeds of distrust exactly. in the child of, of somebody that's their, their own parent. And think about the next generation, what it's creating in their trust issues with their future partners. It does. And it actually puts that child on the same level as an adult. If a mother is saying to, you know, a son, you know, your, your dad is, is sorry and, and they're not taking care of business, that child begins to take on the role of the parent in that home. Mm -hmm. And then his relationship with his father, if his father is involved in the life, is, is impacted negatively by those things. And it goes back the other way as well. And so I just am, you know, so uh, thankful and humbled to be a part of, of this community of educators trying to help bring some understanding and awareness to some very, very intense and often dark um, issues that are, are present in, in families where parental alienation is a key um, a factor. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to understanding and listening to the different distinctions um, and tools that you provide to our um, to the participants because there are certain there are ways that um, that the educators can be balanced even if they they personally like or dislike one or the other they still it, it's their role to be neutral and to Absolutely. not throw favorites and in fact it I assert that by having a standard and the school systems having a standard um, so that there's equity, it takes them out of the crossfire. And then there's actually, there's a fighting chance because truly um, a lot of times alienators will have the, will be dominant. And therefore when you are, when you are in the catbird seat, you don't show uh, signs of, fear and post-traumatic stress and, and all that, you are very all put together. And from an outsider's perspective, um, that person seems like they're the, the good um, grounded parent. And then you have the other one that's dealing with post-traumatic stress because of the way that they've been bullied and, and, exactly. and marginalized. And from exactly. the outsider's perspective, they're like, yeah, sure. This person is unstable and this one's not because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And that is the key. And the bringing awareness and education. And one of the, the strategies, and I'm glad you mentioned that, as an administrator, you know, it, it is it's crucial that you're able to facilitate, um, you know, um, uh, um, or, and or mediate, in some cases, a equitable uh, uh, environment for not just the the student but the parent and the teacher so you're you're you can imagine the the teacher in the classroom who has to deal face to face for two parents that show up in that classroom and there clearly is a contentious relationship um, between the two of them and so the teacher is navigating not just facilitating uh, a, a peaceful resolution for a uh, positive learning environment, but trying to keep that, that, that atmosphere non-toxic. And you've got parents, I, I can tell you, as I, again, through experience, parents have shouting matches, and then the teacher gets involved, and the teacher is, is, is the culprit now of the attack from the parents. So mm -hmm. there are so many different scenarios that um, make it very, um, 
necessary to have this type of training and to present this type of information to those who are the guardians and the gatekeepers in the classroom at all the different levels. It's, 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 it's so crucial to the success because that child is the one that is going to be the most highly impacted in the scenario. The parents go home, they go their separate ways, they get on the phone and they talk about what they did and how they got that other parent told and they showed out and, and all of that. And then I can literally visualize some of the students that I've seen involved in the midst of those types of trauma and, and just the look on their face and that I have to go home with one of these parents. And what is that home going to be like when they get there? That's the part that makes, you know, me passionate about trying to do what is needed to get the right tools in the hands of students and their parents. So what advice would you give a parent who, um, whether they're uh, either parent, what advice would you give to them in dealing with the school? Would you, um, because I, I know how it is. There, a lot of times if they're in a, in a nasty situation, there's, um, and they're not their their desire is maybe to shrink away mm -hmm. and to not be involved um, because of the confrontation or maybe because they feel like that gossip's been said about them yeah. and that, you know, they won't like me. So what would you suggest, what would you, advice would you give to a parent um, in that situation? Well, I, I think that one of the things I've always tried to promote within the schools that I have uh, been fortunate to to lead as the um, principal or the or the administrator for the school is to not wait until trouble hits. If parents are involved with their 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 child at all levels, um, and and regardless of the social economics, regardless of the gender or the background or the ethnicity, when parents take the time in whatever way is available for them because every parent can't just get to the school, but you can email or you can phone. So for me, one of the things was creating an open, open and inviting environment for parents so that parents felt welcome to reach out to, to me as the administrator. Doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything. I think it's crucial for, for the leadership of the school to make sure that school provides a environment of equity and caring for all students. And really that, that is part of the challenge that we are faced with in schools where people are in positions that they really are not, um, they're not um, passionate about. And for some, if, if it's a job, then the school is not going to be able to perform at the level. And this again is my opinion, but it's based on a history of building relationships more so than building the capacity of academic um, and cognitive ability. <clears throat> because I am certain about one thing, children will and can learn, but they will not learn in an environment that is not safe. And they will not um, uh, or take a risk if they do not feel that they have uh, someone that cares and understands them. That's a fact, it's old as the ages, but we can try to get around it, we can add new curriculum, we can add all types of, of, of projects and scenarios, but it's a, a longstanding um, uh, 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 a wor word of wisdom that says, children do not care what you show them until you show them that you care. And I believe that. Yeah. So. I think the key, what I'm taking away is that, you know, you've created an environment in, in, in your leadership of it, of school being a safe place, um, a place where the parents are not going to bring their battles into, into your space. And yet you're, you are there to also, you kind of have to be the, Absolutely. the mentor and the safe space for, for all, both parents to feel like, um, they're important in the child. Exactly. Life. Exactly. And, and you, you, you can have a conversation with one parent without sacrificing, you know, the, 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 the idea that one person is right and the other person is wrong. You know, at the end of the day, the, there has to be 
a consensus. There has to be the ability for compromise. And there has to be the ability for forgiveness. And both parents have to be willing to make that step forward. And if one parent is always the one that is, is, is giving in and always the one that's acknowledging, then you are going to have quite a bit of, of, of difficulty. But as the, the building person, the building principal, the, the um, uh, in facto, de facto parent, you, you have to be willing to say some very difficult things to those parents who are not, you know, um, uh, playing uh, um, fairly, uh, for, for lack of a better word. And I've had to dismiss parents. I've had to tell them they can't come on my campus if they're going to come on and they're not going to be willing to uh, uh, operate in a, in a position of respect towards me, my staff, and the other parent that's involved. That's right. Sometimes wow. that's hard. Sometimes in these uh, high conflict custody situations, uh, the, the teachers and the principal are the only parents that these children Absolutely. have that it, that's, um, you know, that's healthy at that moment. And I'm and, not saying that's not something against the parents, but at, at, when you're in a moment of crisis and conflict and trauma, it's hard to really be what the kids need, need, need at that moment. And, and I would also add, Danica, that you have to look at it through the lens of what's in the best interest for the child. And sometimes that is difficult because, you know, it, it may be that, you know, as the role of the, the, um, the person in, in, in a leadership position, that you have to make sure that you are um, adhering to what the law says with, with compassion, but it is very clear that one parent who may have more money, more influence, may know someone that knows someone that could potentially ruin your career, it is a hard task sometimes. But I think that when we go into it with the understanding that this is something that is going to be in the best interest of the child, it makes it more probable that we can hold our ground and do us in the best interest. Awesome. Well, I know it, time is short and we've got to wrap this up. Yes, it um, always wraps up quick. I know. And, and, and I thank you so much for taking your time out and, um, and having a conversation with me. I'm looking forward to um, your talk um, on April 24th and 25th. It should be an amazing, amazing event. And I, oh, for I sure. all of you to come out and come to the event um, and meet some uh, uh, experts and professionals uh, who might make a difference in your family, not might, will make a difference in your family and uh, the things that you learn and, and take away. So um, that's all we have today for Custody Matters Live. We will see you again next week. Take care.